Boiling Point Road to Hell is one of the weirdest examples of what is known as Eurojank, a loving term used to refer to weird janky games from Europe. And this sweet gem of a game hails from Ukraine and shares far too many elements with Stalker, a game that would be released many years later. It's open world, has a robust faction system, effectively is just a light RPG, and feels very similar to me, a Stalker fan going on about 10 years now. So let's start the start with what might just be the best introduction cutscene I've ever seen. And I'm just going to let it play out because there is no better way to introduce this game. We boil at different degrees. Ralph Waldo Emerson, US philosopher of Hanford, 1803 to 1882. Reality of South America, 2005. Dad, it's Lisa. You gotta come get me. Get on a plane and come get me. Dad, is that you? I can't hear you. Dad! Saul Myers is ex-military. Myers, it's Pierre. The newspapers confirmed There's been no sighting of her for 40 hours. Saul, I'm sorry. She could be anywhere. Saul Myers' daughter has disappeared. Saul? Saul! Saul Myers is going to break her sombra. Saul Myers is going to hit boiling point. So our daughter's missing in Renalia, a South American drug cartel of a country. We play Saul Myers, a badass ex-military man who would do anything to get her back. And apparently, he's at his breaking point. We'll see if he ever reaches his uh, sublimation point, though. A short in-engine cutscene tells us that Renalia is a country in the middle of a civil war between the government and a drug mafia. Our daughter, Lisa, is caught in the middle as a reporter. Our only lead is the editor of the newspaper Lisa was working at. Yeah, this ain't the best country to have to go looking for a missing daughter. But believe me, there's worse. Now, that's spoken like someone who has experience. I'm not too hopeful about Lisa anymore, I'm not gonna lie. But first things first, I pay a small boy two pesos to get the lay of the land. He tells me about a nearby bar and the police station. I decide maybe the police station is my best bet, maybe they have a lead. And well, frankly put, um, they can't be fucked investigating it. They're in the middle of a cartel war for Christ's sake, and I guess that's fair enough, I can't exactly fault that logic. They did offer me a job though, and of course, I took it. The first assignment should be a snap for you. Take a picture of our mayor at night meeting a suspicious character. We need just a couple of pictures, that's all. Just gotta take a photo of the mayor, but it's gotta be at night for some reason. And that gives us some time to go find that editor and see where our daughter is. But not before our nagging wife calls us worried about our missing daughter. Hello? Hello? Don't yell, I hear you. No, now you hear me. Don't worry, I have a lot of experience finding daughters in war-torn countries. And trust me, I do have that particular set of skills. We meet with the editor and... I don't know, he's, he's shifty, isn't he? Like, I'm calling it now, he must have sold her into sex trafficking or something. And then he asks for money before he'll tell us what our daughter's up to, because maybe, just maybe, someone wants her or him dead. You want money then, is that it? If I tell you what you want to know, I have to cover my bases too, to make sure I'm kept safe. And that costs money. About 2,000 pesos. It's 2,000 pesos, and, well, if one thing's universal when it comes to Saul Myers, he never has enough money. If I were you, I'd head straight to the bar. There's a horde of so-called employers hanging out there. By the way, 
Your daughter left me the keys to her car. I should give them to you. The editor passes us the keys of Lisa's car and tells us to head to the bar to find employment. This is more or less what the game is. You get money, pay someone for information on Lisa's whereabouts, and then because of bad info or just plain old lying, you have to pay someone else for better info. This happens a lot, and the amount you have to pay only gets higher. Thankfully, there's a lot of side missions to do for quick money, which also gives us the perfect opportunity to talk about the factions. There are about six in the game. The Renalian government, which includes the police and the military, the communist guerrillas, the mafia, local Indian tribes, although really they're native South Americans, but that's fine, bandits, and the American CIA. All of these factions are different enough visually and in their writing that you won't confuse them. Well, the bandits and mafia look pretty much identical, but at least their writing's different. Mafia does drugs, bandits still shit. The interesting part, and the somewhat annoying part, is that depending on who you go to for your first few missions, they are basically who you are locked in with until the curtains fall. For me, that was the local government, said the police and the military. These guys are enemies of everyone but the civilians in the CIA. I made a lot of enemies in this way, and maybe it wasn't the smartest move, but I only made this choice because just outside of town is a military checkpoint, so you kind of have to go through it or around it. I figured it was smart if I could just go through it because I'm allied with them, and it kind of was. I never had problems with that checkpoint, and I always knew this town would be safe. So, I imagine if you play a game online with the Mafia or the Communists, you aren't going to have such a good time in town, but a much easier time out in the wilds past town. There is a few times in this game's story that it might have been easier to have certain factions be friendly with you, but the game does offer up enough alternative ways through these missions that you'll still be fine regardless. Like, for example, we have to meet with the Don for this main quest, but if you're not friendly, you have to like sneak or shoot your way through up to him. While well, Mafia players can just rock up. It's a balance connect and you won't be locked out of the game depending on what you do, so just go wild. It is also possible to restore your relations with other factions as a local bar has people who are willing to let you pay to get your reputation back to neutral. But it, it's, it's not cheap, which basically means you're forced into a faction from the first hour, but if you are willing to save up money, you can change that and thus enjoy other factions missions. Which brings me to the mission system. Each faction has a predetermined list of missions that you work linearly through. There's a lot of them, and each you know, mission gives you more money than the last. Completing the mission gives you positive rep for your faction and negative rep for pretty much everyone else. The general structure of these missions is kind of just going from point A to point B, point B being some base. You kill a guy, take an item or a vehicle, and then go back to the quest giver to get money in the next mission. Is it simple? Yes. But it really does work, and to be honest, like, I didn't really bother with the main quest right till the end of the game, as the side missions are really fun. The missions honestly remind me quite a bit of Stalker. They're simple in execution, quick to do, but sometimes they get complicated. And, you know, the complications mainly happen within story missions, but sometimes you do get unique missions external to the story, though. For the most part, the missions are just going to be going to, you know, going to some place and shooting people. That is to be expected, it is a shooter with open world RPG elements in a decently expansive open world. Which brings me to gameplay. This game is kind of a mixture between Far Cry and Stalker, but came out a year after Far Cry, it also predates Stalker by years, and both are Ukrainian studios, so I don't know what the Ukrainians smoke to make such unique and innovative games, but it is paying off. The first thing that stood out to me about Boiling Point is that it's trying way harder at being an RPG than a shooter. The first thing you do in this game, and this is encouraged by the game, is not to go shoot up some bandits, but rather just to ask for information. In fact, you actually aren't told to go shoot stuff for a while. The game never even explicitly tells you to go buy a gun. You only get that side mission if you ask where the gun store is, and it gives those kinds of like go to place missions if you ask where anything is, so it's hardly exclusive as well. There's also heaps of characters in the starting city that you simply won't be forced to interact with, which again is interesting. Boiling Point respects the player enough that they don't go and force waypoints down your throat. 
There was actually an extended period of time of like an hour or so where I forgot where the gun store was because there was no waypoint. And I would normally say this is like a short-sighted decision by the developers, but it isn't here. This is the kind of game Balling Point is. It doesn't hold your hand really at all. There is a lot of alternative ways through missions that you won't find unless you go around talking to people. For example, I could pay the architect of the Dom's Villa for access to a secret hidden tunnel, or I could just go for the front door. Both works, but one is far easier but also far more expensive. Options are good. So what about combat? Well, Boiling Point is a very strange shooter. It's kind of halfway between an arcade shooter and a tactical shooter. It's positioned for its HUD and its interface to be an arcade shooter, but it's actually a very slow and very methodical shooter. You can't sprint around and shoot people from the hip. You need to slow down and wait for your aim to recover. You need to take cover, but sometimes enemies can shoot for cover, and I don't know if that's a mechanic or a buck, which will be a reoccurring theme in this game, by the way. So just keep an eye on your health and keep spamming healing items which, thankfully, you can attach to a hockey key. Keeping an eye is an important thing to say as well because there's no other indicator of damage. There's no blood glazing your eyes or other effects. It's just a number ticking down in the corner of the screen. Volume Point also technically has a localized damage system where each limb can be damaged separately. The game really wants you to hit I and like, go into the inventory and like, drag the healing item over the limb. But you can also just hit the hockey and it'll apply healing to every limb. So, you, yeah, the limb based damage is kind of redundant. The interesting part though with healing is that there's two ways to heal. You can eat food or you can inject syringes. Both have their drawbacks though. Food is often far heavier than syringes and thus slows you down more as the more you carry, the slower you are. But it's also cheaper in the long run. While syringes are really light, but the more you use them, the less they heal you as you build up a tolerance to them. This tolerance doesn't go away over time. So it does have the effects of making longer fights, like keep the tension as they go on. But you can get this tolerance reset of the doctor for pretty cheap. But that doesn't help you during the fight or even immediately after it. This idea though is really interesting and it does work out well. But for me, I just found myself just buying heaps of donuts from the donut man in town and taking just enough that I was moving fast enough and then stashing the rest in the back of my car. It works pretty well. I could then just drag these to my hotbar for quick health and combat which isn't easily done with syringes as they vary in their type, meaning that each type is a different hotbar slot. It would just take longer and be more cumbersome. The actual shooting though? Well, I'll be blunt here. It's fucking terrible. Don't get me wrong, it, it does work, but it is far from enjoyable and far from good. Guns just feel bad. There is no clear indication of whether a bullet has hit the target. Sometimes the enemy might flinch, but I find myself missing it a lot. Your mileage will, of course, vary, but this isn't helped by the fact that most of the guns are wildly inaccurate. This is the case for all the guns bar three. The sniper rifle, the revolver, and the scoped assault rifle. All of which are insanely accurate, provided you are moving. During the early game, I was nailing headshots with the revolver, and in the late game, I was you know, using the sniper rifle consistently with the scoped rifle for the second duty. But everything else, you really should just avoid it. They are way too inaccurate unless you're at point blank range. And this could be explained away as one of the mechanics is Saul Myers getting tired when he moves more than 10 meters. And I think this has, has an effect on your ability to hold a gun straight. I don't know though, as the game doesn't explain any of its mechanics. So it is a common sight to unload a magazine into an enemy and nothing happens. This could be dodgy hit detection, or it could be Saw Myers needing a nap. We'll never know. In terms of the armaments, Road to Hell has the normal assortment of assault rifles, pistols, shotguns, and other more exotic weapons like grenade launchers or crossbows. Which I know makes it sound like there's a lot of guns, but there really isn't. There's a few different assault rifles, like most games, there's, there's kind of like a linear line of succession. The best assault rifle is the one of a scope because you can actually hit your target at a range greater than 2 meters. Pistols are mostly there to make it so early game enemies have less firepower than you. Shotguns are shotguns. They feel 
pretty lackluster, but they're decent enough for close range. In theory, this smaller collection of weapons should allow for tighter gunplay, but the reality is the opposite. A big part of Bolian Point's combat loop is being in the middle of nowhere in a South American jungle and hearing people call you gringo from the trees. You can't see where they are, but they can see you. There's next to no cover and they throw grenades like nothing else. And yes, you just kind of got to hear the grenades being thrown or get lucky because there is no indicator. Which is fine, I do like this. You also have grenades, so it is pretty even. But combat is so tense because your bullets do just as much damage as the enemies do. And you die quickly, so do the enemies. It's even and it's fair. The game never really throws like, you know, entire you know, militia armies at you. At most, you're dealing with maybe 10 enemies in pretty you know, wide open spaces. Which means that, you know, if you get lucky with like a placement of some trees, you can flank around enemies. There are some problems with this, however. The AI does just kind of forget that it's in a game sometimes. It'll stand there or sometimes even just freak out and start running around for no reason. This makes them either super easy as they don't even know you're there or they become unstoppable as they transcend space and time. Especially considering the blatant fact that Bolian's Point map was not made for this kind of shooting. The fact that the map is mostly wide open spaces with no cover is pretty annoying, but it does have the added benefit, I guess, of making these spaces feel real. You'll be spending most of your time in Boiling Point in overgrown forests or claustrophobic urban settings. These dominate Road to Hell's map. Forests are hard to fight in because there's no landmarks, there's no clear way to see the enemy, while urban places are often not riddled with as much cover as one might think. Plus, all of the Mafia bases in the country are wide open with no cover. They also have watchtowers to skew the odds in their favour. All of this adds up to a game which really excels at its visual and map design. They do stuff right that not even AAA developers in the same genre can do right. And yes, I'm looking at you Ubisoft. The encounters in gunplay kinda tell me that they wanted most gunfights to take place at medium to long range, with close range being res like preserved for like urban and interior buildings, which, by the way, most buildings just have enemies that have shotguns just hidden in corners, so do be careful. The choice to, to focus on long-range encounters would explain why weapon accuracy is all over the place, as they obviously want you to consider scope weapons solely for long-range and automatic rifles for close range, plus enemies also become aimbots at close range while they more or less can't even hit shit at long distance. There is also stealth in the game, but it's buggy and rarely works. I never used it, so take that as you will. I think overall, in terms of combat, Boiling Point isn't really trying to be an arcade shooter or a Call of Duty clones like most games of the time. It's trying to be Boiling Point, and that's pretty okay with me. It is important to note that back in 2003, shooters were not what they were today. The original Call of Duty came out in 2003, that's when the modern shooters started. But I think Boiling Point, and I'm not kidding here, might have looked at Deus Ex for inspiration. Deus Ex and by extension System Shock have pretty middling gunplay and feedback by today's standards. But they are the closest games I can link Boiling Point's gun feel to, and that isn't a bad thing. I never really thought much about the gunplay until writing this video, so that kind of goes to show how functional it is. It never really draws attention to itself because it mostly just kind of works, apart from the weird weapon accuracy. It's clunky, simple, and mostly forgettable. It's fun and it's tense, and while gunplay is underwhelming, it doesn't fall apart like other games, and continues to be fun and exciting right till the end. But as I open this section with, Boiling Point is more of an open world RPG than it is a shooter. The grand majority of your time in Boiling Point is spent exploring, or otherwise navigating its large expanse of world. Be it on foot, driving, boating or flying, you spend a lot of time just exploring, going from point A to point B. And it is a pretty good time. You'll be driving pretty much 90% of the time you aren't buying something or shooting someone. So let's talk about that. For the most part, it's, it's okay. Don't expect quality racing game handling, but it's not bad. Your experience will almost certainly come down to what you're driving. A heavier bus will perform like a bus, slow and long to corner. But a smaller sedan will be perfectly fine at everything. 
The only real caveat is, you won't want to drive a bus in this game. Why? Because the majority of your driving is going to be spent off-road, and a bus is just too slow and wide to weave between trees and up cliffs, so you'll be driving a sedan. Driving off-road though is really fucking fun. There is a healthy amount of small obstructions to drive around and plenty of stuff to see and do. While the physical act of driving from one side of the map to the other is fairly uneventful, the fact that the world is actually engaging and interesting to explore fixes that. Sure, a road trip with a planned beginning and end in a safe route, i.e. a road, is going to be fairly simple. But if you alter that plan slightly and go off-road, who knows what you'll find. Whatever it is, they are actually exciting to find. A lot of this comes down to the idea that this game doesn't really have waypoints of any kind. So you really just kind of find random stuff and it's just there because it's there. And you know, there's plenty of threats out there as well. Snakes, swarms of bees, getting your car stuck in water, fighting an enemy squad, plus the ever-present threat of helicopters. It's honestly really good. If there's anything to boast about Boiling Point, it's that their combat level and overall design really comes together to make a game that feels unsafe but adventurous. The, excuse my lack of precision wording here, vibe of the fictional country of Analia is seemingly just chilled and relaxed. I mean, the fruit grocers here sell two kinds of pineapple. And again, it connects with the aforementioned world design. The whole game is freeform, and I think that's the point. I mean, they even threw in the ability to fly helicopters and planes as well. But you know, they're really bad, so I never use them outside of the tutorial missions. But the biggest problem with its world design is really just the pacing and the locations you visit. I sp mainly spent my time in the western part of the world, which is where the game begins. But I never really ventured into the eastern part of the map, despite the fact that it has its own town and various side locations to explore. And that isn't to say that it's really all that markedly different from the west. It's the same trees, grass, and general vibe, it's just more of the same basically. Not bad, but a little disappointing. But by the game's end, I just wasn't really in the mood to play much more, which is a shame. And we'll get into why in a little while. For now, what about the economy in Renalia? Well, as you can probably expect, it's mostly guns and drugs, which is perfect for a budding American tourist who really wants to immerse himself in the local culture. And to be clear, there isn't like a player-driven economy here. You can't sell heaps of bananas to drive down the price of banana-based goods or anything. The core loop of Boiling Point is doing a mission and then restocking your ammo and gas and then buying any new weapons upgrades for said weapons that you want. With the idea being to save up enough to progress in the main story. So when I started with the police and military, I was only earning in surplus of, you know, probably a couple hundred dollars. But by the end, I was earning about 2,000 per mission. I won't be able to tell you what it maxes out at though, because both the police and military missions actually bugged out for me and I couldn't complete them. Which is apparently, according to a lot of forum posts, a very, very common bug, and there is no way around that. Some recommend chaining some money in, or just reloading a previous save and hoping for the best. I did neither, and I just jumped ship to the commies. It is also worth noting that um, the phrase, reload a previous save, isn't really as simple as it should be, as the save system just kind of stops working after a few hours of playtime, and you just kind of have to hope that your quick saves and hard saves actually save. So if you do play Boiling Point, expect to lose a lot of the progress if you don't check your saves after you save. It is a massive problem and there is no way to fix it though. It's basically just part of the experience at that point. Oh god, none of them are saving. Oh. Oh no. What? Oh no, it's bugged again. <laughs> Talking about experiences, let's talk about shopping. For starters, to scroll the shop's contents, you need to click on the shop window and then scroll. You can't just mouse over it. Every time you buy something, the shop window resets to the top. Which, mind you, you can buy multiple items at once, but it doesn't seem like you can because you have to confirm each individual item. So this isn't too much of a problem with like smaller vendors, but the weapons store in the city has so many upgrades 
that it can be hard to find what you're looking for. So it's not nice when like you lose your position in the fucking encyclopedia of a fucking weapon store. Plus, you need to click confirm to confirm the purchase and there's no way to see how much money you have left after you buy something. Which is really fucking annoying because money is the one resource you have to manage. You need to have it otherwise you are completely fucked in every regard. You won't have healing items, ammo, a car, and thus the ability to get more money. But the problems with the game's weird UI don't stop there. The inventory screen is just as fundamentally fucking bizarre as well. You still need to confirm, that's fine as it's at least consistent, but my problem is we can't rearrange our inventory manually. The overall amount of clicks needed to do something is far too high. Plus, let's just say you want to hold all your stuff to sell it. Well, you're over a cumber now and your walk from the, your car to the shop is going to take about two years off your life. So, fuck it. Let's have what I think might be the the first dedicated problems chapter in a suffering through video. First off, audio. There is so many weird aspects to how this game approaches audio. Sometimes there's a click when a music track has changed. There's about four lines of dialogue that NPCs randomly say, and yes, that is four regardless of factions, I swear to God. Sometimes Saul will just say random shit about how he needs to save his daughter, but only after he honks the horn. Anything could happen. I ain't just picking mushrooms and berries here. Most of the dialogue in this game is drowned out by the music, no matter how loud you set the dialogue to be in the settings. Sometimes guns don't make sound. Sometimes my car gets stuck in the floor. A number of side quests broke themselves and there's no way to fix it. The game just crashes sometimes. Saves don't work 80% of the times, sometimes I just randomly lose money, and this is just the bugs, not even the bad decisions made by the development team. For example, weapon upgrades. They are, besides buying new cars, the most expensive things in the game and they are practically useless. They don't increase damage, you know, the stat you would actually want to change, but rather effective range on weapons, magazine capacity and rate of fire. Three things that don't really matter when you can just get a headshot. And you have no reason to be shooting at people from 500 meters away, because where would I even do that? There's too many trees around the joint, you physically won't be able to. The sentiment is nice, sure, but it's fucking pointless. And there's also this weirdly unexplained, like, player skills XP mechanic. Like, you can upgrade yourself, but it's passive and it's never explained how it works or what the numbers actually mean. I really do not notice a difference between start and end game, besides my guns being better. But that comes down to money, not random XP numbers. So yeah, boiling point is good on the surface, but the experience of playing it is literally my personal nightmare. A common fucking trend in this series of videos. But with all the gameplay out of the way, let's talk about the story. When we left off, I was gathering the paltry sum of 2,000 pesos for the editor so he can tell me where Lisa was. I hand over the money and well... Excellent. Now listen carefully. Senor Myers, your daughter is in big trouble. She really wanted to write something about Don Pedro. Don't ask me who that is. No one messes with Don Pedro, senor. Some call him the Black Spider. He's got something to do with every illegal activity in this part of the country. Go on. It seems that Lisa fell into the local drug cartel led by Don Pedro, who was also the last person to see her apparently. And Pedro has a reputation for killing people for asking dumb questions. Where can I find this Don Pedro? They say Don Pedro has recently built a new villa not far from our town. I don't know where it is. But Luis, the bartender at the Black Jaguar, he must know its exact location. The editor doesn't know where Pedro's villa is, but he does give me a hint that maybe the barkeep knows, and then hands us some of Lisa's things. Now, you might be thinking, cool, we can now drive a boat. We now have a part of a magical artifact, a key, and a directional microphone. That's pretty cool. It isn't. None of this comes in handy except the boating manual. We drive a boat once though, so it's hardly a help, but still. And also, even after beating the game, I have no idea what the key's used for. It's just there. The artifact, however, is just collectible that 
when you get all the pieces allows you to access like a treasure trove of goodies to sell it's not really worth doing but it's there and i was only interested until i googled what it was all for the directional mic though i don't know i couldn't even get it to work Down at the bar, Luis, the bartender, informs us that the villa is to the east of town, and even marks it on a map. He also informs us that the architect of the villa is also in town. And as it turns out, we actually just helped him with a side mission a couple of hours back. He gives us the run down the villa, the main entrance, the boat jetty, and then tells us that he and Pedro actually installed a secret tunnel to his office. The only caveat being, if I want to know where it is and get a key to it, I have to pay 5,000 pesos. And that, that, that's a lot of money. That's half a dozen or so missions in the early game, and this is one of the cheapest of what I'm going to call money gates in the game. This is roughly how the campaign progresses. We get told we need to pay money to progress, and then we go farm for a few hours. So yeah, I fuck off, do some missions, get off the road. and come back in about five hours with the money that he needs. We snag the key, grab some donuts and ammo, and head off to the villa. I park out front and swim over to the secret entrance, unlock the door, and slowly advance up the steps. I open the passage into this office, and, well, I guess the car parked out front full of donuts and ammo wasn't the most subtle thing in the world. Because it turns out, the architect has ratted us out. But at least Pedro is pretty friendly. We awkwardly get dropped out of the cutscene and then talk to him some more. I do want to bring up, though, that pretty much every time you talk to someone, in the background, you can hear, like, a lot of random noise. Like, people shooting at rats for no reason. It's really funny, if not a little annoying. This does look a little familiar. Ah, gotcha. So you're little Lisa's father. Very nice to make your acquaintance. She's told me a lot about Hey, gringo! It. And even if half Come of out. it is true, then I regret not having met you earlier. Pedro is aware of our skills, and he's also aware that our daughter is a grown woman, apparently. Gross. Turns out Pedro here has nothing to do with our daughter's disappearance. She was never even hurt by him or his people. She apparently even called from her office to say thanks, so it seems that Pedro isn't clear. Which thus means the editor's a liar, and Saul doesn't like liars. So why'd the editor tell me the last time he saw her was before she left to come see you? What? Did that editor say I did something to Lisa? I always knew he'd spill his guts if anyone offered him money. But if he's trying to pit us against each other, then this is really bad business, my friend. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have another little talk with him. I'm sure you noticed, but that old bastard is a lily-livered coward. If you put the screws on him, he'd probably tell you if he wears ladies' underwear and anything else you want to know. Me and Pedro, though, we do have an extended chat about his granddaughter, uh, a learn-to-fly plane book, and then I'm off to go pay the editor a visit. And also, it turns out the guards here aren't hostile either. So no matter what you do to your Mafia rep, you can always come here about being, you know, politely killed on the way in. Which is a nice touch. But what about that editor? Well, we bust down the door, approach the editor with the same energy my cat has at 3am when she wants her biscuits. What do you want? Me? I don't want anything. But you might want to think of a reason why I shouldn't kill you. Who the devil do you think you are? Huh. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you everything. What do you want to know? I want to know why you lied to me. I want to know why you didn't tell me you saw my daughter after she met with Don Pedro. And what's more, I want to know- oh! And then he gets shot. Who put that guy on the roof to take you out? Now you're asking the important questions. I wonder how much this is going to cost me. We emerge back in the gameplay with the same theme looping in the background as Saul and I interview the locals in an attempt to find the assassin. He looked vaguely like one of the twins from Matrix 2 or like a rejected CIA agent. And I do remember hearing from a certain little boy in the game's opening hour that there is a CIA agent around the ruined tower in game. So I head on over and well, to cut a very long story short, I don't find shit. But maybe the donut merchant knows something. I mean, I'm his best customer. He wouldn't charge me for that info, surely. What'd he look like? Just like a normal guy. You look like someone who has some money. I might remember for about 1,000 pesos. Never mind. Sure, take the money. 
It's all coming back to me now. Scary guy. Not too big, kind of scrawny. But I wouldn't want to fight him. Baldy, and he had a, a strange tattoo. I couldn't quite make it out. And yeah, he only had one eye. Oh, but the look he gave me with that one eye, it bore a hole right through me. He's got one mean stare. And then Mr. Donut hits me with a 3,000 pesos pay gate to unlock the license number of the getaway car. And then he admits he would have given it for free for the police, so I guess I need to find you a donut guy. This one's a fucking cunt. I head over to the police station to discover that a current side mission is stopping me from asking him about the plates, so I guess I'd better do that now. And if only it was that simple, because the mission is bugged. I need to plant this beacon at this airfield, but it won't let me progress. So I guess I need to find a different way, so... Maybe Don Pedro? Oh, um, well, that's a lot of money. Maybe not. Okay, let's try the checkpoint outside of town, maybe. Oh, yeah. We stopped someone just like that. Seemed like a normal guy. Just a bit too... Which bar? A joint not far from here. First one down the trail. They also sell fruit there. Edgardo sure to be in... And the garden hitmen are apparently down the road a bit of the roadside market bar combo. It's actually the same market where I learned that little old ladies on the side of the road sell grenades. So that's cool. The guard is drunk but still very much alive. Turns out he actually knows the killer and his name is Belly Button. They're old friends apparently and he's willing to share some info if we cough up some cash. And it's only 1000 pesos. That is leaps and bounds better than Pedro's 20k. It really does save you money if you shop around. He tells us that uh, Belly Button has some beef with a cigarette salesman in town, and I drunk drive back to town. The cigarette seller is out tonight, but his co-worker tells where to find his brother. But Saul Myers doesn't believe the poor guy and keeps accusing him of being Alberto, the cigarette salesman we're after. Look, let's drop the math, cut to the chase. Just tell me how you know the guy who killed the editor. You had a little chat with him when he drove by in the car. And don't give me your song and dance, I know everything. Uh. You don't understand, senor. This is my first day at work here. Humberto asked me to stand here. He is not me, senor. You must talk with him, maybe. You're a liar, Humberto. And I'm just about done with the ask questions first part of this little get-together. On my dear madre sor, senor. Humberto, he is the one who is always selling his stuff here. Me. I am Maurizio. Please, look at my ID if you do not want to believe me. Damn it, where the hell is Umberto? He's probably in his casa, senor. He said he was feeling not so good. That's why he asked me to stand here today, senor. On the soul of my sister Maria. His casa is in that direction. When you find it, you will find him too, senor. Hundred percent. Adios, Mauricio. I hope that really is your name. Because if I find out you lied to me... I will come back here and I will show you what those cigar cutters of yours can really do. Or should I say, Umberto's? I swear on the soul of my sister Teresa, senor. This is the truth I am telling you. I suck up on ammo and donuts before heading up to his apartment. You know, just in case he pulls a gun, but surprise, surprise, the game drags it out yet again. Ah! Help, por favor, senor! Polizia! He's going to kill him! He's going to kill him! This isn't Umberto, but his unnamed brother. Sure. So where's Umberto? Well, Belly Button's out to kill him in some shack in the jungle. Okay. Well, I don't know. Let's go learn how to pilot a boat and drive a plane, just in case that ever comes in handy. We arrive at Belly Button's house, or Umberto's house. It's never clear. And there's heaps of people around who are all gunning to kill us. So we shoot them all dead and then accidentally kill Belly Button. Oops. Turns out Belly Button is actually called Alberto Banco. So I steal his ammo in a note that informs us he was hired by someone. So I guess we're back off the dumb page to see how much this information will cost us. And apparently it's a cool 25k. But if we keep pushing, he just tells us that Jibbery Jibendez might know something. But he's in prison right now, so we better go break him out. Or not. Because this quest line is also bugged, and there's no way to break him out if you're friendly with the government factions. So yeah, we're heading to the bar to hope for a working solution. 
We talked to an old communist gorilla called Jamie, who is more than willing to help us out, provided we do two jobs for him first. So I guess Saul Myers is joining the revolution now? I do wonder if his previous experience in finding daughters actually happened in 1930s China. I guess we'll never know. We need to steal a truck of weapons and steal a helicopter, both from the military. The real caveat though is that both vehicles are in separate corners of the map, and seeing as I have to drive a car to get there and then drive their vehicles back, I have to leave my cars up there. So it's going to be tough going and a lot of walking. But first off, I learn how to fly a heli. And then go and park my car at the drop off point, and then walk and swim my way over to the closer truck objective. I shoot up some all allied military soldiers, and then the truck is too damaged, so I decide to load up my save. And well, the game crashes. I attempt to load it back up again, and it looks like I've lost about 30 minutes of progress. I better walk over again then. I guess. This is a reoccurring problem with the game. Sometimes the saves just don't work, or they don't overwrite the previous save or something. Or the game just crashes when you go to save. I've tried everything to fix this, but it just happens. You just kind of have to deal with it. So I walk back up to the bridge. I shoot up all the military again, steal the truck, and then discover that the game actually gives you a car for free here, so you can drive this car up to the helicopter. That's a nice touch, that makes it so much more simple for the player instead of playing musical cars and walking for an hour. Again, nice touch. Saul, using the pattern of the mind control mounted machine gun, kills everyone here and flies away with the helicopter. And on the way back, I learned that every enemy in the game has missiles and will try to shoot you down. Luckily we have flares to stop that from happening. I park on the roof, the helicopter explodes. I reload, park on the roof, and complete the mission. Good job, Comrade Myers. You didn't let me down. Jamie greets us as a comrade. Little does he know, I had joined the communists for financial gain. And then Jamie informs us that Banco was hired by Aztec, an ex-bandit who is currently hiding up in the mountains from his ex-friends. And well, you guessed it, it's a long drive, so you better stock up on donuts and ammo. We drive up and down the winding roads through tunnels of old and up a dirt path that only the trees know. And then we find a lovely shack in which the inhabitants are probably doing smack. We pull in, saw yawns, so we have a little sleep. And it's nice to know that Aztec is continuing with the trend of hired hitmen only having shacks in the woods. We wake up, walk in. You should treat your visitors nicer. Not when they come for my money. I'm not here for your money. I'm here about your colleague, Alberto Bonco. So you're not after money? Ah, and then you're out of luck, my friend. Because they are after the money. Who are they? Trouble. Listen, gringo. These people are after me. They kill you too. Just for being here. Hold them off for a few minutes while I get my brother on the radio and hurry him up. He's flying over here now. He can get us out of here. And I'll tell you everything I know about Banco. Just keep them busy. Yeah, whatever. Go ahead. And well, yeah, we've got to defend them till a helicopter arrives and picks them up. The bandits, mafia or whatever, were basically fighting. Just keep shooting RPGs at the house till there's no house left. It's a cool sequence overall, and it stands out as the only real scripted set piece and boiling point, as nothing really happens like this in the game again. So this is unique and cool. It's always odd when a mission as simple as a wave-based defense is unique, isn't it? We get in the heli, and Saul tries a moaning for once. Mr. Crazy Eyes is selling all of your stuff for real cheap as he's fleeing the country. So I stock up on ammo. No donuts though, so I guess I'll have to go back to my normal guy sooner or later. I even buy a shotgun here. I talk to Crazy Eye's brother Indian, who tells us that he has no idea who ordered the hit on the editor. They just paid up front and paid a lot of money to have it done quick and relatively quietly. But he does give us the safe code for the editor's save. This implies whoever, you know, ordered the hit had insider access to the newspaper. He even gives us a helicopter manual, despite the fact we already flew one for a mission earlier. And then the game crashes and I have to redo all of that. On the drive back to town though, I encountered the suicidal man and I guess I answered wrong because, well, you know. You can add mental health advocate onto Saul's list of skills to improve, right next to reading the room and negotiating for higher pay during a job interview. The editor's office actually turns out to be full of paramilitaries who all wear like black clothes. They're really tough, way tougher than the other enemies in the game. But the safe does offer us our next lead. 
We need to find out who registered a certain bank account, and presumably that tells us who hired Banco to kill the editor. My biggest gripe is though that I can't stop thinking about how the cops haven't cordoned the area off or tried to find evidence or really anything. Because you know, a guy was shot in his place of work, and it's been like a week since we were last here and nothing's been done. But yeah, I guess we'll just do the footwork ourselves. So the first stop off is the bank, and the manager's unwilling to tell me, which is fair enough, that's procedure, but he would tell me for 22k. Don Pedro wants 20k, and well frankly I don't have that kind of money. But then I discovered something. There's an old lady at the front of the bank selling flowers. If you buy a bouquet from her, you can seduce one of the bank clerks and go on a date. Where if you buy her champagne, she'll spill the beans. And then the game crashes, I do it all over again, and she spilled the beans. I offer the help and she points me to a hacker. The hacker wants some help with his dead graphics card, which involves us using a new technique called taxi warping. Because I didn't know this, but the taxis scattered around the map are actually fast travel points. And as the replacement GPU is in the other town on the eastern side of the map, I decide to use the taxi to get there. It is way faster than driving 20 minutes one way and 20 minutes back. The GPU costs us a little bit of dough, but it's way less than Don Pedro's offer. And then we fast travel back to the hacker and get the info. The account number is actually registered to Experiential Electronics. They are in a warehouse on the outskirts of town, which apparently means in the middle of nowhere, which also happens to be full of the same black clothed soldiers from earlier on. I get in and hold the CEO of Experimental Electronics as he bleeds out. You the director of Experiential Electronics? Yes. What is all this equipment? Who are all those people in black? <coughs> those, are, those are Don Diego's people. <coughs> Just henchmen. <coughs> you need Miguel. <coughs> Miguel Rodriguez. <coughs> A man who will prove to be the biggest pain in my ass. Lightning. Lightning in the head. <coughs> Pueblo Faro. Miguel. <coughs> We'll come back to that. Oh. Pierre Ferro, a mine up in the distant north of the map. It's going to be a long drive no matter what we do. So I stock up my backup car full of ammo and donuts and get going. The mine took me far longer than I care to admit. Maybe an hour to clear it, and mind you, this is with constant save corruption. I had to clear this mine multiple times between my quick saves not working and game crashes. But the simple goal here is that somewhere inside this mine is our man Miguel, and we need to get to him. But there's also heaps of communist soldiers and mafia enforcers fighting it out. Now, if you recall, I am friendly with the commies, but for some reason, they attack me here. So I now have two factions of enemies to fight and a huge mine to clear. And unbeknownst to me, I was running low on ammo and healing items. I took time to take what I was missing from enemy corpses, but a lot of them had the wrong ammo types or simply didn't have any to spare. It was a long, grueling experience, only made worse by level design that made no sense. As once you're in the mine, you have three tunnels to choose from. Only one of them will get you to your objective, the other two really don't matter. It's just more enemies, and yes, there's no loot down here. It is a pointless endeavor that costs you money and could potentially get you killed, as this is a long fight. No matter how many healing items you have, you won't have enough to do everything on the first go around. Syringes build tolerance way too quickly to be useful here, and donuts way too much. It's a pain. The one you need to go down though is the one on the left. And after a long fight, you reach the bottom and Miguel, who will request you to get him a US passport so he can flee the country. And at this point, I don't even know who Miguel is. Couldn't I just press a gun to his temple and force him to tell me? Saul doesn't seem to be too nice to anyone, anyone else anyway, so what, what's the point? Couldn't I just fucking fuck him up right here? No, because yes, I do have to walk all the way back out and go back to the city. Or... I can get shot dead and respawn in the town. Normally this would suck as you lose money and some items from your inventory, but the thing is, I didn't care at this point. This game had become so physically grating that I wanted it over. It was a small mercy to be spawned near the objective. And guess what the objective is? Well, it's the elusive CIA agent that I mentioned earlier, which, fun fact, I spent an hour earlier trying to find him, and Saul just magically knows that he exists now. The agent tells me that we can get a US passport if we eliminate a communist leader in the next town over. 
It was time for us to refresh our baked goods and take a cab to the other town and kill the communist leader. Bang and a boom, passport acquired. And now it's time to take a cab up to nearby the mine, walk up and get my original car from nearby the blown up shack. Because for some reason, yeah, your car just stays there. Take the car to the mine, kill some fucks, hand over the passport. He tells us that a member of his crew, Antonio, might know something about the men in black uniforms. It turns out Antonio is two minutes up the road, but oh no, he gets grabbed by the same men in black. The local native chief and tells us that Don Carlos, and I don't know who this one is either, has been setting up a new warehouse over at the pyramid ruins nearby. I sleep and move in for the kill. After a quick fight, I kill everyone and find our man. Why are you screaming? Ah! Just why are you screaming? Ah! Calm down. Ah! Okay, buddy, let's calm down now, quietly. Nobody's gonna hurt you. Anybody who could, well, I've sent them off to where they belong. You have? Yes, there are no enemies of yours here, just your friends. Well, one friend, <laughs> uh, that'd be me. Are you sure? I swear it. I just have two questions for you. Who is Don Diego, and where is he located? Where is Don D D D Diego? I don't know. And I don't want to know. He's a scary man. Very, very, very scary. Pure evil. What's he look like? Like a regular Don. Fat. Evil. With a cigar. Damn. That's not so useful. Do you remember anything else about him? Maybe he mentioned places, people, anything? Him? No, he didn't mention any places. No people either. People were talking to him. It's strange, I, I just thought... He is Don Diego and they're calling him Don Pedro. Weird, don't you think? Are you sure? Are you sure they were calling him Don Pedro? Hmm. I might be wrong. But I think I'm right. Don Diego is Don Pedro. The Don Pedro. He's the villain here. He's the bad guy. And we need to go pay him a new visit. But not first without sending a message as a nearby radio starts up. Alvaro. Alvaro. You hear me, Alvaro? Did you find out what that worker revealed? Yes, Don Pedro. He managed to tell Saul Myers everything. Alvaro? Are you at the villa, Don Pedro? Stay right where you are. We need to have a little chat. And I don't really know if this reveal even works at a narrative level. We have no reason to suspect Pedro of anything. Sure, he's a crime boss, but he's done all right by us. I do wish the game would clear up what Don's are who, though. There's a few too many, and the narrative is getting confusing now, as none of these plot threads are clearly linked to each other through anything but names and happenstance. Don Pedro is the only Don that we've actually seen in person, though. And by the time we make it to his office, he's fucked off in a helicopter. Oh man! Coyote! And I'm not kidding here, we just magically know where he's going. But because this is the last stretch of the narrative so far, I go stock up on food and ammo for the last time, because I don't think I'm going to be back here for a long while yet. The objective marker puts us out at sea somewhere, so I figure a boat's a good idea. I wander around time for a little bit, and find a guy selling a boat for a decent price. It even comes with a mind controlled machine gun. I take sail for Don Pedro's island retreat, and now have a long voyage ahead of us, let's reflect on the narrative thus far. First off, I do want to be honest with you lot, I did have to use a trainer to get give myself more money and make myself invulnerable because, well, the save system was bugging out so often that that pyramid ruins part took me three hours. The saves kept corrupting. It's not a big deal as everything before and after the pyramid ruins is legitimate, but I thought I would mention it. But in terms of the narrative, the narrative doesn't really exist within most of the game. 
I reckon 90% of the gameplay is just doing missions from various factions, while the other 10% is split between buying ammo and donuts and trying to find my daughter. Which is a shame, as the devs obviously have a decent ability to script and set up interesting combat encounters, like the mine in the shack from earlier, but it never really gets there, especially when most of the narrative takes place within the last two hours of your playthrough. And as such, it's really easy to get lost or confused on, on the who's who at boiling point. For example, why is there five different Dons but you only ever meet one of them? How does the editor relate to Don Pedro? Is it solely because he looked into experiential electronics? Why does the CIA just kind of pop up? The most enjoyable part of the story thus far has been Saul Myers. He's kind of just a dad being a dad. He's got dad jokes. He has a no shits given personality until his daughter brought, is brought up. It's, it's nice. And he's the biggest cunt to everyone who isn't his daughter. He frequently undertakes jobs that involves killing people simply because he knows he can do it and that he'll get money at the end of it. He doesn't even really seem to have a sense of loyalty to anyone. He flips crops between the military and the communists with no regard to what happens in the wider world because of it. The introduction cutscene I reckon paints the wrong image of Saul and paints him as a man who is angry. But honestly, he should be fucking grinning in that cutscene. He's going to a country where he gets to kill whoever he wants whilst getting paid for it and he gets to explore the sights, sounds, and tastes of a new country. What kind of middle-aged, balding ex-military man doesn't want that? He's an American action hero planted into South America. A man who could take either side in the conflict because he just doesn't care. And this is so in line with the game's tone. It is an action movie crossed with a road trip, and it works really well. But as we're about to see, the game takes this weird fucking hard turn into classic sci-fi tropes and ideas. The cutscene with Pedro is void of any sounds but the dialogue. It's eerily quiet and a weird end to Pedro's development in the plot. No, you can't get away with this. My people don't play games. You had- ah! Why do you think I know where she is? Where's my daughter? Talk. <laughs> okay, do I have to ask you again? <sighs> Okay, not so you win. I'll tell you all I know. Your daughter's all right. She's alive. Just lost some weight. Where is she? In Caruso's laboratories. Don't worry. She's safe there. What laboratories? What's going on here? What do you need all this equipment for? Because Lisa's alive and is being held in Caruso's lab. Who is Caruso? Well, that would be Albert Caruso, you know, the guy from the bar from the beginning of the game, the one obsessed with Nikola Tesla. Yeah, well, he kidnapped our daughter because she's immune to his mind control technology. So we leave Pedro alive, I think. I didn't hear a gunshot. Equipment and you, I ended up getting in way over my head. And the overly animated Saul Myers leaves the building and walks right into another cutscene. Well, to cut it short, a scientist descends from the heavens in a helicopter and gives us a computer chip that will make us immune to mind control, and then flies off and leaves us here on an island surrounded by enemies. Good going. I stock up on donuts for the last time and begin the longest drive in the game. The weirdest part is, this last, like, mission, I'm pretty sure I've played it before. I mean, I'm sure some of us have. If you're watching this channel, you know I love Stalker. Because this last mission is literally just the conclusion of Shadow of Chernobyl. The rough plot isn't even all that dissimilar. A group of scientists have created a device that can control people's minds. The ultimate goal being world peace or something similar. They might control a paramilitary group who functions as the device's protector. Sometimes people get disconnected from the mind control like Alberto was. And in the game's final mission, you reach the center and there's anomalies, which yes, Boiling Point has as well, but only in the last mission. They're meant to disable your car, but I believe they're bugged, they just kind of keep driving. And then we enter an underground research lab, much like the X-Labs from Stalker, a game that came out many years later. And I'm not saying that Stalker copied Boiling Point. My point is rather that Ukraine's game industry was really small at the time. So maybe people worked at both companies and something rubbed off in the middle. It's just really interesting to me. But let's finish Boiling Point. The underground lab's progression is basically clearing a room, getting the keycard, using that card to open a door, and rinse and repeat three times. 
It's a slow uphill battle where you slowly but surely run out of ammo and healing items. There's no way to be prepared for this because the game doesn't seem like it would do something like this. When they said an underground research base, I kind of just thought, oh yeah, it'll be the mine again. But this is much longer and there's no going back from here. This is also the point in which I realised just how terrible the combat actually is, as the close quarters nature of this section just highlighted how much the open-ended design of the overworld hides the gunplay. The gunplay in this game is really not all that good. I frequently miss shots despite shooting them through a scope. Enemies rush me with shotguns, I don't have any choice on where to go and how to approach. When you build a game for wide open jungle and then stick those same systems into a concrete box, well, it doesn't really hold up. It crumbles under its own weight. This whole section just goes on until you have a cheeky chat with the scientist that is protecting Lisa. And as it turns out, we can't disconnect it from these machines because it will just kill her. But if we shut down the power generators, we can. One caveat though, we need to blow them up, but luckily there's apparently RPGs down at the armory. So we go to go get them, but then we wander into a fucking cutscene with Don Fuckface. So, hello Myers. You kept me waiting. He spews his heart about how he wants to fix the broken world. No more war, no more poverty, if everyone's mind control. That kind of shit. We've seen it before, and technically it's not wrong, but individuality is what makes us human or whatever the fuck. It's actually a really similar mindset to what the Watchdogs Legion lady said. Think of Not us again. As the most interesting part of this dialogue is that Don Fuckface doesn't seem to know that he kidnapped Saul's daughter. Why did you get into this, Myers? Eager to play a superhero? Don't you think you've got a little carried away? You should know better. Even superheroes die who push it too far. Well, someone's got to take a stand and stop jerks like you. The guy's just here to get his daughter back, right? Like, he wouldn't be here otherwise. I don't even think Saul cares about the mind control plot. You want to stop me? What for? His daughter, you fucking idiot. Look at this country. Drugs, war, gangsters everywhere. Children are dying from hunger. The survivors pick up machine guns at 15 and start killing each other. It's their choice. They should go to college instead. That line says more about Saul Myers than anything else. This guy is so clueless about this country. He doesn't care. If my daughter can do it, why can't yours kind of do it? Plus, what a perfect line read from the voice director. My god, that was amazing. You see, Caruso, you made one huge mistake. You should never have touched Lisa. Now you've only got yourself to blame. And it's gonna hurt. You're too late anyway, Myers. In five minutes, the antenna's signal will be running at full strength. And your chip won't help you then. After that, I might even make you my chief of security. Oh yeah? We'll see about that. But enough of this, come on. We, we have five minutes to till this tower's at full strength. We won't be able to resist the mind control or whatever the fuck. We gotta destroy this tower by pulling it down by blowing up the cables holding it. So I grab some RPGs from the armory and I try to survive the endlessly respawning enemies who rush me with guns. Interesting note about the armory though. Um, you may remember how I said I had basically no ammo left. Well, the guns in the armory don't have any ammo and they're also different guns to what the enemies outside use. So you can't even kill the enemies and then get ammo for your guns. There's just no way to get more ammo if you need it. And because of how this, this game works, the guns that the enemies drop will just jam after one shot anyway. Fun. So they just keep respawning and I keep losing ammo in my precious donuts while trying to survive. The enemies actually respawn so quickly that there's no way to eliminate them all. I doubt there's even an upper limit. You just have to pray that you have enough donuts, which thankfully I just did, luckily. I don't know how you meant to even do this using syringes. If you used syringes, you would have built up such a tolerance by the time you hit the facility that you wouldn't be able to heal. I suspect many had to cheat to do this bit. Especially given that you need to carry 8 RPGs, and this will probably crawl you down, slow you down to a crawl, as by some miracle your stats are higher, which yeah, by the way, no idea how those work. It's not documented anywhere and literally doesn't make any sense. So yeah, it just works, I guess. But after a frustratingly long time, but through perseverance and desire to see this game done, I do manage to blow up all of the cables. And we share a moment with Lisa, where she discusses her next job. So, 
Lisa, now you understand why you should always listen to your father? If you had, you'd still be happily working in some women's magazine, writing articles about nail polish and boyfriends. Sure, Pa. So, does that mean you're gonna listen to your father's advice from now on? Sure thing, Pa. Good girl. Daddy? Yeah? I'm thinking of quitting journalism. Just before I came out here, I was offered another job. A much better one. Mm, what kind of job? A medical job. The noblest profession of all. One month of training and I start as a paramedic. And then we'll see where life takes me. It's pretty far from home, though. How far is far? Nepal. They've got a real shortage of medical staff out there, so the Red Cross... Hey, Lisa? Yes, Pa? Can we talk about this when we get home? Sure thing, Pa. And yeah, maybe she should, should just take it easy for a while, you know? Forego any third world countries for like a week, maybe two? Because fucking Saul has to catch up with his favourite series, Peaky Blinders. <laughs> Although, I guess maybe Saul's more of a house hunters kind of guy. Probably turn to the TV when you see South America, though. He's got PTSD from all the walking. The game then ends with credits with an original song laid over the top. And that was Boiling Point. I think Boiling Point is an almost perfect example of a developer having a vision, but not necessarily the budget or skill to make it fully realized. But god damn do they come close. Deep Shadows have somehow managed to create a sort of precursor to both modern day Far Cry and Stalker. Two series that, dare I say it, have changed the industry. So that alone is very respectable, but then Boiling Point is, by itself, a very good game. It just suffers from being one of the most buggy games I've ever played. And good design can't make up for that. The save corruption in particular is a big problem that I don't think many will put up with, and that's, that's fair enough. I nearly gave up in the end, but I didn't, and I got rewarded with a very fun little game. But that was Boiling Point. A game I really enjoyed until my saves started corrupting every 10 minutes. There is a sequel that was published a few years later, which I will be checking out sometime soon. Next time we check out something drastically different. Six people throw up a